Okay, and we are now live for the zeroth test community chat for Open Insulin. So, just uh, started to work out the. Uh, uh oh, this is this is different. All right, first technical issue to fix. There we go. Okay. So maybe you should explain what is the purpose of, of this. Ah uh, yes, of course. Well, um, as we've gotten uh, more and more attention from the media and had more and more people come out in person to volunteer for the project, uh, I think a lot of people who aren't working on the project are also interested in what's going on and uh, just want to learn more about what we're doing first of all and perhaps also how to contribute so uh, we thought we could have a live chat and uh, just invite people to come ask us questions uh, and if no one's around then we can just kind of talk about what's on our mind with the project and have just like a an informal uh, chat about whatever we feel like chatting about so that is the the spirit of this is you know very informal um, and just just kind of uh, talking about what's going on in the broadest sense so uh, with that um, I know a lot of people are curious about what we're working on day to day, um, what our next uh, few milestones are that we're hoping to reach in the near future, how that relates to our overall goals. Um, so yeah, I mean, some people may not even know what our overall goal is, and our overall goal is to make a, a small scale system for producing insulin that uh, would uh, let many new options for uh, people to obtain insulin come into being. Um, with a small scale system, you could economically produce insulin in the context of a local patient cooperative or a pharmacy or a hospital or a setting of that nature. And that would mean that you could have, uh, you know, uh, hundreds or thousands of small insulin factories all throughout the country and the world and uh, this could help to address the crisis and access to insulin that has uh, come into being now uh, because there are only three producers and they've been raising their prices in synchrony for uh, a couple decades now and it's reached the point where this is putting the cost of insulin uh, at a level where it's out of the reach of a lot of people who need it. Um, a recent study showed that a quarter of people in the U.S. who use insulin have had to ration it at some time. Um, we know that worldwide about half the people who need insulin don't get it. Uh, so, you know, we need to address this problem and the strategy we've chosen to address it is just to make the the means of production of insulin ubiquitous. Uh, and then if we look past insulin, not that that isn't uh, a very substantial task already, but if we look uh, you know, past that into the future, having open source equipment for producing and purifying proteins is also something that will be useful for a lot of other medicines and a lot of other scientific projects. So we can make uh, all of those things much more accessible to many more people. and. Uh, you know, get more people involved in, in science and R&D around these things, just solving, you know, new medical problems or just satisfying their curiosity and learning, uh, we can enable all of that. Okay. Yeah, question. Oh, yeah, we Okay. Oh, Esther's in. If there, if there is no question, I have no question. Oh, yeah. We, yeah we, I, I want to see I if think... Esther has a question, actually. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
Oh, cool. All right. Esther is uh, summoning the uh, the whole mob into the stream. That's great. Okay. Well, it's it does seem like she's a little busy, so um yeah, Jan, do you want to start rambling about something that's on your mind? Yeah. About what we're doing in the project and, and all of this? I mean, I think we did a really good page shot of what we are doing. Yeah. Um, I think it's really nice to have a project. Yeah, sure. I mean, that's that's the high-level stuff, so I mean... Uh, yeah, there is there is a lot of different aspects. I think you need to cover it. Yeah. Well, I think there's, there's some interesting new developments because for the last couple years, ever since you joined, basically, we were just working on the uh, Pikia system to make insulin, but now we have uh, two more strategies that we're starting to develop, and there's also the one that Alex uh, developed, and it could be cool to get a little bit of a, a sense of the different bioengineering projects that are going on and what the trade-offs are that we're exploring with those. Yeah, I really like the fact that we start working on the hardware, also not only the only the, the the production of insulin, but trying to see the issue more as a as a whole, and not only oh we need to have the possible to do insulin, but more we need to create the environment that people can produce insulin uh, everywhere and have their own production mechanism. Yeah, I, I, I think this recent development is pretty, pretty nice, pretty important. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, we actually have a few questions now. Um, yeah. Esther is just asking for uh, you know that overview of what's going on with the project. Any roadblocks at the moment? Jan, your audio is echoing also. I don't know if you can... Yeah, I think it's because of where I am. I need to find a better place for this. But, okay. You know, in Baltimore, the room are way bigger. So, yeah. Many, many whole time, so. Ah, yeah. Practical. Well, you're coming through all right for me. So hopefully it's not too bad. Yeah. Um, uh, I'll, be, I'll be walk on that on the next one. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. what was your, uh, your gotta, question? Got to bring my headphones next time. Um, all right. Uh, next next question from Esther. Uh, any roadblocks at the moment? Um, so I think we could definitely talk about our equipment woes and yeah. how we're solving those. So for the for the purification of the of the insulin so we are we are working on two different insulin versions and one of them we are kind of stuck at the uh, confirmation process where we try to find we don't have the tools to really analyze the sample so we start with third party and this is uh, pretty uh, tedious right now uh, because we have some technical issues uh, with the cell body. But we can, we produce something, we have something, we think it's the, the good protein, and now we are working to confirm it's a good protein. That's good. For the, for the equipment, we start to have a really good team uh, they, people are, are working on a lot of different uh, aspects of it, so uh, some people are working on the bioactor. Uh, I work on the on one part of the uh, FPLC, I work on the, on the UV uh, wholesale, and other people are working on uh, the peristatic pump and, and, and the mixing chamber, very cool. Which are all the different parts you need to have a chromatography system, a, a protein purification system.
Okay, great. So, yeah, also, uh, what are the next steps for Open Insulin upcoming milestones? So, you probably already touched on a few of those. Um, yeah, the, the big milestone still here is to have quite this insulin so far. It's still the big thing to achieve. But there is a lot of, I mean, you probably can talk more about that, but there is a lot of uh, more um, administrative work and more um, global strategy kind of work that, you know, I, I can't talk too much about. Yeah, so the, yeah, in terms of the technical work, we're, even though we have some of these other uh, projects starting up with, uh, you know, developing the open source production hardware. Um, we're pretty focused on, you know, hitting the next milestone of getting the first sample of actual insulin verified. Um, we are also working on the organizational front to set up a standalone nonprofit foundation that will be separate from Counterculture Labs. Uh, so far, we've just been working as a project in Counterculture Labs, which is a its own 501c3 entity, but the focus of that entity is very broad. It's kind of maintaining this whole space and this whole community around us. So we are going to be creating another organization that's just focused on the work of Open Insulin. As we've uh, been discussing, it's gotten a lot more complex and there's a lot of different focus areas and it's gotten to the point where we need our own organization to run all of the stuff that's going on and um, I think it's also going to make it easier for us to get donations, get more of a budget to work regularly on this. Uh, if all goes well, we can start to hire some people full time to work on all of these different uh, technical challenges as well as organizational challenges. Um, so yeah, that's the part that we haven't really uh, mentioned yet. but. Uh, you know, it goes beyond just forming this new entity. Um, we will need to look at what other entities need to be part of the whole ecosystem that is going to do this R&D work to develop the small scale production technology. And then after that, uh, figure out how to organize the actual production of insulin as a medicine for people to use, as opposed to just something that's happening for purely research purposes. Um, so then we uh, have yet another set of complex questions to uh, look at. We've started to do some research on those and uh, it seems like there will be some options for uh, doing that in a, in a reasonably straightforward way that isn't going to be ruinously expensive and that will still let us have this, uh, uh, this really deep economic fix to the problem by having there be, uh, you know, hundreds or thousands of producers as opposed to just, you know, adding one more to the mix. Um, so, so yeah, that is the other set of uh, tests that's coming up on the horizon that I think is, you know, once we take advantage of all of the interest in that's come from people who want to help that we'll be able to dig into uh, in 2020. Okay, next question. Um, how many people are negatively impacted by the problems we are trying to solve? Um, so, uh, I actually did a really rough estimate of this, and it was based on the 50% worldwide figure. Uh, so, yeah. I, I started from there, and then I tried to figure out uh, how many people with diabetes that is uh, and I just used like the prevalence in the US which is like somewhere around uh, like 1% of the population give or take quite a bit um, and then you know extra which you know there's there's a lot of assumptions here that you could do a better job with so this is just trying to get at a very rough ballpark estimate um, but took that and 
uh, just kind of looked at what the mortality rate would be uh, uh, given that 50% of all of those people do not have insulin. So the type 1 people you pretty much figure are sadly going to die almost immediately, uh, you know, within a matter of days to months probably, and then the the type 2 people will have their, you know, if they already are insulin dependent, they already need supplementary insulin, they're already pretty far along in that disease, so, you know, not having insulin could result in a life expectancy of maybe a few more years before one of the complications takes effect. So, uh, you know, based on those two assumptions, uh, we arrived at a figure that, again, a very rough estimate now, we could do a much more precise one, but just to get a sense of the ballpark of what this would be, it was about um, a million a month uh, were dying for lack of insulin. So uh, then to put that in perspective, uh, we uh, looked at major wars and it turns out that that is uh, just about the the ballpark of how many people were dying in World War II from all causes and that is the deadliest conflict in human history as far as anyone can tell so and you don't have to go uh, as far as that but you can also look at all the financial issues that uh, I think diabetes can bring you if you don't have insurance then you have to pay from your pocket and it's a, it's a lot of money so then you have a lot of uh, financial bankrupt and uh, so yeah you you have a lot of different aspects where you can be negatively uh, affected by by the crazy price of insulin and being. yeah yeah and just looking at that one most severe part of the problem. Uh, yeah. This is a problem whose magnitude is, is like as big as any other problem that humanity has ever faced, basically. So Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's also what the problem will be, because there's an increasing amount of... of I mean, the, the prediction for uh, uh, diabetes is to really skyrocket in the future. Mostly because of uh, diet and and the fact that a lot of countries are adopting Western diet, so in a lot of, of countries, it's expected that you will have a lot more uh, insulin-dependent uh, people. So yeah, it it will affect more and more people also, I think. and there is no 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 certainty that, that big, the, the big pharma will try to produce drugs for them because if there is no money to make that they will not care at the end. So, so it's a, yeah, it's a big issue and it will be a, an even bigger issue in the future. Yeah. Um. Yeah, so it's it's pretty clear that uh, at the very least we need to continue our work, and uh, you know it's no surprise that a lot of other people are also interested in this problem now. Um, all right, so just going down the chat here. Uh, next question: uh, What is the status of the ownership problem? That is preventing others from buying out what you produce. Um, well, uh, I guess you might have in mind the scenario where, you know, if, if someone started a for-profit company that had a lot of investors who were looking on a return on investment and had control over that organization, then they might, uh, be inclined to take an offer from you know, one of the incumbent producers, and then the incumbent producer would just uh, shut everything down or something. Um, and that sort of thing does happen a lot in the biotech startup world. So um, the way we're actually organizing this is uh, taking a lot of cues from the open source software world and uh, 
following that pattern, we have a nonprofit foundation, which is just uh, focused on stewarding the development of the core technologies, and that's the one that we're setting up right now. And then around that organization that just stewards the technology and makes sure it stays open, um, you could have a lot of other endeavors uh, come into being to use the technology to solve problems like making medicine. So that's where we uh, envision there being an ecosystem of other kinds of entities like um, patient cooperatives, hospitals, pharmacies, perhaps uh, state uh, level production uh, companies uh, such as the state of California is uh, contemplating setting up a uh, manufacturing program under the control of the state. So uh, for other medicines, not directly related to our work yet, but uh, you know, we're seeing precedents like this. Uh, and so we're just creating this organization now specifically for the purpose of keeping all the technology open and making sure that no one comes in and encloses that commons that we're trying to create. So that's, you know, the, the primary purpose of, of that part. And that's like really the, the first problem we have to solve. Um, yeah. And at the end, we're also uh, really cautious on the idea of having uh, VC money for the same, same reason that we, we don't want to have somebody or some uh, H1, I, I don't know who just pour a lot of money in the project, but then at the end we lose ownership of the ownership of the project. So uh, there is a lot of um, um, yeah um, thinking and organization to do around that and be sure that we the the project will still be owned by the people who, which are taking part of it and by the patient. By the team. Yeah. Okay. So we have a, continuing in the chat on this topic. Uh, how is Linux doing it? So that's actually really closely related to how we came up with this idea. Um, it was from looking at the Linux Software Foundation and the Python Software Foundation and similar uh, organizations like that where there's a nonprofit foundation and it might receive donations from for-profit entities um, that it uh, you know, then uses to fund the development of some aspects of that software, but there's also a broader open source community around it and everything is on an open source license. So, um, you know, e even if someone were to obtain control of that foundation, it would be very difficult to uh, directly keep others from using that technology. You know, the, there are concerns, especially now with there being a lot of corporate influence in these kinds of foundations where uh, the direction of development that gets pursued for something like Linux or a programming language or whatever it may be, may be more in the interests of the corporations than other members of that community that are using that technology. So, well, thank you. Yeah. We have a box for David Anderson. All right, good. He's our, uh, one of, one of the longest uh, most stalwart members of the Open Insulin Project. Uh, so it's probably related there. Um, so anyway, uh, uh, yeah, there, you know, there are con concerns like this, but we're, um, we're structuring things in the same way because it solves some of those concerns the, at, the, at the most uh, direct level. It protects what we're working on from just being outright bought and and taken away from the public in that way. But then we're also looking at the governance structure to make sure that donating money doesn't give you a disproportionate amount of influence, because that's kind of the next level problem that we're seeing with these open source software projects. So we're actually uh, working out a governance structure right now, and we just looked at our bylaws uh, a couple hours ago and we're discussing this topic and we're, we're kind of finalizing the details around this but we have a structure where people who use insulin or people who are doing the work and making 
the uh, on on developing that technology as part of the foundation are guaranteed a certain number of seats on the board. So, uh, and also just giving money is explicitly not a way to become a member or to get a seat on the board or anything like that. So, um, you know, we welcome donations, of course, but we want to make sure that uh, you can't get a voice in the governance of the organization just by giving money. You have to actually be working on it directly, giving your time or using the thing that we're ultimately going to produce. Okay, and uh, this is the discussion is continuing a little bit in the chat. So let's see, Little Pink DK, would you ever crowdfund around this? I'm curious, similar to the RVC project. Um, we actually did do a cr small crowdfunding campaign on experiment.com to get started. Uh, since then, we've just been getting small, sporadic donations. Um, we haven't really done an organized fundraising drive until actually the end of last year we kicked off another small one just to raise money for some equipment for the lab in Baltimore where uh, Yana and Louise are getting set up and uh, that is actually in progress right now so we're when we come back and do the stream next week we're gonna focus a little more on that and we're gonna publicize that a little more widely because um, we're gonna kind of be bringing things in for a landing at that time and we're gonna uh, you know, make a little bit of a bigger deal around what we're doing in that area. And we also may do a bigger crowdfunding campaign as such later in the year, uh, once we have all of the organizational paperwork taken care of. But you can always donate by going on the uh, OpenSV website and then donate button, then you can use to donate the button. Yeah. Um, okay, let's see what's next. Um, Esther, uh, a little higher up, can you speak more about the global project Open Insulin is working on? I saw that Biofoundry has been developing their own classes surrounding this and open sourcing the doc. So let me leave that to you, Jan. Yeah, I, I, I should watch the class that Alex did. I, I didn't watch it yet. But the idea is we want to have a decentralized uh, system for producing insulin. So we want that, that uh, all open insulin production uh, place will be independent and owned by the worker there and the patient. So we already have few collaboration of all the bioacure place, which I'm interested to to develop some, something like that. And uh, Alex with the biofoundry in Australia is part of it. So he developed um, um, an, a, another type of insulin, which is, uh, I think it's, he called it, it a insulin. And the idea is it's uh, insulin where you leave um, the, the C peptide. And so you don't, you cannot make it it easier to produce. But the issue with insulin is it's a completely different molecule, then you have to redo all the FDA process if you if you hope that it will be used by uh, by a patient. Uh, so it's a it's a really ambitious project. It's really interesting, but it's not the same approach of what we are trying to do in Auckland where we are basically trying to redo uh, already existing existing uh, insulin for, because then it is speed up sync for FDA approval in the US. Okay. Um, so let's see what else is here. Um, crowdfunding, yes. Um, 
Limistiv, how quickly can you produce insulin at present? I saw some really promising numbers on your website for how well your solution scales up to many patients. Um, yeah, so there was yeah. uh Yeah, basically, uh, for expression, you, I mean, with, with CFJ, you can do two-day two day induction. So you do one day for growing it to have that, to have some biomass, and then you induce uh, and you induce for two days. So it's, then you have all the downstream process. So I think in four day you can do a batch. But usually, what you can do is you do multiple batch uh, uh, in parallel, and you can just shift one day, so you have always something running. Uh, so yeah. Uh, Pipelining. Hmm? Pipe yeah, automatically. You can, you can easily do that. And you can also uh, do continuous feeding where you use the same batch, but you feed, then you collect the. Because it's, uh, the protein is secreted, you can just collect the, the superlatans. And then you re pour some media and you keep producing with the same. But at one point, the, you start producing less and less. But yeah, you you basically one batch is is uh, is uh, around four days, and then you can do four or five batch per, per week. Yeah, um, and then you know uh, those production numbers that you mentioned. Maybe we could just recap those quickly. So like one yeah. batch, what would the yield of just if we're doing like a five liter you know, batch. Um, what do we say that that's going to yield? Um, gram. So yeah, we're saying like one gram per liter, just kind of conservatively, of the target protein, and then um, a unit is about there's about twenty five thousand units to a to a gram, give or take. So you could get yeah uh, from five, you could get. Uh, 125,000 units and that is uh, you know say uh, let's see what do I do in a week were we saying that like a, a thousand units a week was the typical amount um, Yeah. I well, I can yeah. I can figure it out again from my own uh, usage yeah. patterns. Um, so let's see. Just round it off to like a hundred a day. Yeah. So seven hundred. Could say you know maybe it's a little low. So a thousand a week to be safe. So you know that's enough for a hundred and twenty-five people for a week in that single batch from a five-liter bioreactor. And you know, let's say you have losses in downstream process, so it's only a hundred. Um, so you do a batch every four days, um, or you could have multiple batches going in parallel, as Jan said. Uh, every every batch that you do in that month takes care of a thousand people for that month. Uh, so you're doing pretty well. Uh, you can really produce enough for a lot of people at a very small scale. Yeah, and at the end, the estimation are based on uh, kind uh, what you can expect for uh, using this kind of pulse. So with uh, Bishop Asteris or um, uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So right now we are definitely not at those here, but we need to optimize the strain and do a lot of screening, and then you can expect having those kind of yields. Okay, uh, next question we're getting. Uh, is the goal to have something like the uh, Free Software Foundation philosophy? It's not free as in beer. Um, so, so yes, I think we definitely want to have something that is free as in free. Um, but we also are well aware that a lot of what is killing people right now is a cost issue. So also we're thinking about how to build on freedom to reduce uh, cost in money uh, and 
these are related, I think, because you know the more the more options there are for making this, the more directly people can participate in the making it who use it, the uh, less uh, kind of exploitative profit taking there can be around that. Uh, a lot of you know what permits you know a hundredfold markups and ridiculous profits is just uh, the fact that there are no other alternatives right now. So uh, you know the the actual cost of producing it is is very low, um, and that means that that once many people can produce it, the price should quickly come to that cost of production. Um, One thing I like there about this is. Because you know I'm French, and in France the cost of the buyer of insulin is without insurance is 15 euros. In in US it's 10 times more. I mean, or 20 times more if you say it's 300 yeah. dollars. Sometimes more. 40 times more I've heard. So. Yeah, and it's it's the same company who produces it. So at one point it's not like some something magical happened in the US which make that they have to sell it 300. They, they can do it, it will make more profits, so we just do it. So, yeah, the, the price that the big pharma are doing are um, not related at all with the cost of production. If we are in the same point, you produce the same way, 20, 40 times less in, in Europe. And they are still making profit. It's not like they are losing money doing so in Europe, they are still making profit. Yeah. Uh, just making way less profit than the US. Yeah, I mean the cost of production is what between two or three to five dollars a vial. Even with the yeah. corporate overhead, that's what the estimates are. So so yeah, if you're charging fifteen, that's a great profit. That's a three X profit. Like that's yeah. already pretty crazy. You don't see that in many places. Um, yeah. Pretty good margin actually. Right? Yeah, it's a great margin. <laughs> um Yeah. So uh all right. Next question, um, and it'll be compatible with pump systems, right? Or is this just only injection? Um, so the first type of insulin we're working on is Glargine, which is a long-acting one, which would not be suitable for use in a pump. Uh, but we're also looking at following that up with some rapid-acting insulins, and those are the type you would want to use in a pump. So uh, it's... It's definitely like high on the list. It's not a absolute top of the list, but it's high on our list. Yeah, we, we are working on, on those two versions of insulin in parallel. So, so, I mean, hopefully we will have both around the same time, and then we can, you know, have not, not one, but the two versions of insulin would be great. Okay, and then uh, have you all reached out to Scott Hanselman? Um, I have not heard of Scott Hanselman, but I would be happy to uh, look into that. Uh, did you did you want to say a little more about that idea? Uh, Pick nine one one seven, or you know, just uh, just drop it in the chat if you want, or we can take it offline also if you prefer. Um, just email us at the uh, email on the website openinsulin at gmail dot com and we can talk about that. Um, okay, um, couldn't you help the most people by charging maybe one-fifth to one-tenth of what the alternatives currently charge and use those funds to hire more people and produce way more insulin with the price steadily decreasing? Um, so, I mean, that is, you know, one way you could do it is you could create like a a, a company directly that is just producing the insulin directly um, and do something like that. Um, I think that's that's very different from the strategy that we're currently pursuing, which I think can have a similar positive feedback dynamic, but isn't going to be doing it under like the centralized control of one organization. So first of all, the, the nonprofit foundation that we're setting up right now is not going to produce any insulin for people to use. Uh, that will be for other entities to do. Uh, and then there can be uh, many different types of entities um, that do that. The cost of getting set up in terms of capital is very low. Um, already it could be done for probably $100,000 for a very decent sized production 
effort that could serve tens of thousands of people. And if we get more of the open source equipment to do this online, that could come down by an order of magnitude. So, um, you know, then, then there can be things like these patient cooperatives where the people who are using the insulin can decide how much money they want to take and reinvest into growing the effort directly. Um, and, you know, if people can afford it, I think there will be a, a strong incentive to do so from that perspective. So yeah. um, we can we can still have the, you know, the, the decentralized production network grow and obtain the money it needs to grow uh, through, I think, a different mechanism. Yeah, yeah. What I would love to see is the price uh, that any any pollution uh, place, when they need pollution insulin, that they can be more transparent on the price they are doing. And I can totally see um, having, you know, selling a vial of insulin and saying, okay, one tenth of it, or there is an extra charge of it, which would be one or two dollars, and those one or two dollars would be dedicated create a new production, producing place. And having, having this um, domino effect when you can you know, multiply the production place just by reinvesting the money from previous places. And in the long term, also imagining that you can have part of the price we can be used to develop new drug and then uh, start producing new drugs and on maybe Invest in research. I, I think there's a lot of things which can be imagined if it's if it's reasonable and people still can afford it because it's still the main goal. But I think it's reasonable to think that a fraction of the price will be used to reinvest and, and to give up new drugs. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think just the uh, the way we want to do that is a way that's really transparent and really just like directly under the control of the people using that medicine so that their interests are not compromised. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of solidarity among diabetics. Uh, you know, that's one of the few good things about having diabetes, speaking from my own perspective, is just that, you know, people are so, uh, you know, stalwart and and we stick together. So um, I think just once we have the mechanisms in place to uh, put that great community spirit behind making more insulin and helping people, then it can really take off. Uh, all right, so yeah, Little Pink DK noting at Novo, it's less than $3 to make a vial. I know as I worked a little with Novo on some stuff, I mean, yeah, that's yeah. I don't think that's new information. There was a study that was done uh, by some academics, and they found exactly that, that the cost is somewhere between 3 and $5 to make, even in like that big corporate setting. And then uh, I think in that same study, they found that Iran was selling it for $1.55 a vial. So, you know, maybe there's yeah. a subsidy involved there from the state or something, but like you can clearly make it very economically yeah yeah um, okay the hubs question is answered you say great um, are there partners you have at present who will directly produce the insulin um, we are in discussions with some uh, they're still at the early stages um, it's hard to have that discussion in any kind of depth before we actually have that production technology ready to go and it's been tested and everything so we're still kind of pulling into the finish on a couple of those tasks that are you know blocking that conversation but I think you know that's that's like a big 2020 action item is to uh, specify that better and you know actually establish those partnerships optimistically yeah and because we are committed to open source we also have to be sure that everything we'll do with any potential uh, partner would be uh, in open source uh, philosophy and, and then we can really share technology and resources. And yeah, this has to be really think through before we are jumping in any collaboration. 
Okay, so let's see. From Pick Scott is a program manager at Microsoft, diabetic, and involved in a lot of community projects. Um, yeah, I mean that's that's great. Um, if you want to make the introduction or you know, just whatever you feel is best, we'd be happy to uh, to talk to Scott. It's great to you know always grow our network uh, and you know build that solidarity. Uh, so let's see. Next question. Um, in the political hotbed, have you considered reaching out to Bernie Sanders to offer a solution to driving down farmer prices? Could potentially benefit both Open Insulin and his campaign. So very interesting topic. So I better, I will leave most of that to, to Jan because he follows the campaign probably a little more closely than I do. But I, I, I will say we have spoken to some members of uh, the House of Representatives uh, or their staffers rather, and uh, uh, at least one who is a, a very senior member of some key committees is is interested in yeah. uh, helping out in whatever way might prove useful. Um, so uh, as for an ongoing presidential campaign, that gets a little more interesting. Uh, I think it would, you know, require a candidate to really want to campaign very strongly on um, a fairly specific issue and, you know, make the, a very, very important issue that affects a lot of people, but also in a sense a very specific issue. Um, so, you know, that would have to be really framed in terms of very much more broad questions like how should the whole healthcare system work? And, you know, I think yeah. there's a lot the, of lessons that could be learned for the rest of the system if what we're doing works out and, um, you know, just judging how similar ideas have worked in similar contexts, I, I expect it to. Um, but again, I think that'll be a lot easier to make a political case for it when uh, people have actually been doing it for a while and it's not very speculative. Um, anyway, I, see one of the, I, I might be wrong, but I see as a 501c3 that we can't endorse any candidates, so I don't think we can do any sort of, uh, of political statement. I, I think we can't do that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, so there are some specific prohibitions on this type of nonprofit organization. I think it's you can't you can't endorse a candidate and you can't attempt to, I think, influence the passage of any legislation. Um, okay. So, you know, we we should we will be consulting with our lawyers more about exactly where the line is, because um, I think mm -hmm. just in terms of doing uh, think tank type things and talking about policies in general and the case for various policies, uh, I, I, I expect that that it will be permitted and uh, given that it is, you know, we'll be pursuing that as, as one of our main focuses, I think, once the technology is in place and then uh, the, the question shifts to how do we actually get people using it to make the medicine they need to survive. Yeah, personally, I wish we could do that, uh, and if we can, I'm the thing is, we have to consider that as, uh, as open insulin, so we have to be sure that everybody in the project would be on board with that. But, I mean, if we have a shout out from Bernie or from, I don't know, any progressive candidate, uh, yeah, I think it can be really good for the project in general. But I don't, I, I don't know the specificity of what we can do in council. Usually, I just, you know, think it's better to not you know, take too much risk on, on this kind of stuff. I don't know. Maybe I'm too shy on this kind of stuff. Okay. All right, next question. Um, I'm curious to know about FDA rules on this too. What's the stance on this so far? Um, so first of all, we have a lot more research to do on this. Um, and I think there are even even now, we're aware of multiple different options um, that, you know, could let us do this decentralized manufacturing uh, potentially just within existing frameworks. So that's why we're looking at patient cooperatives and pharmacies and hospitals because, to some extent, there are, um, you know, uh, uh, 
space ca spaces carved out within the regulatory landscape for production that happens at that scale. Uh, so we're kind of looking into what of those options are, you know, hopefully there's more than one option that's viable, but like which, which of those options uh, do not impose a really prohibitive regulatory burden. So um, if we were just to, for example, be a regular pharmaceutical manufacturer and market this as a drug the way uh, companies normally do, that is the whole framework around that is really biased towards large-scale centralized production, so it isn't really a good fit for what we're doing in terms of the costs involved and what kinds of risks you're managing with the various parts of the approval process. Um, and that, that would uh, be the you know standard biosimilars approvals process as it is known. Um, and then, uh, you know, beyond that, I uh, actually just had a really interesting chat with uh, some of our uh, advisory network earlier today. And, you know, there's this idea that uh, we could potentially make a device that makes insulin and then get that approved as a medical device that does what it says it's doing uh, you know, so once we just do the tests around that, which should be very straightforward to do, um, then we could get that device approved, and then it would just be a question of uh, getting a, a person getting one's doctor to prescribe the use of that device to get one's insulin. So that is that's probably like the lowest overhead um, ideal case scenario for that um, that we've heard about so far. And you know, again, we just heard about it today, so don't know a whole lot about how that might work in detail. But uh, you know, everyone we talk to seems to have some idea. You know, we're talking about experts in FDA regulation, they all have kind of some idea about how you could get this done, and they're not all the same. So that's great. That might mean that we have a lot of viable options for doing this, and we can just have a whole menu to choose from. So that's that's been our experience so far. We're still in the early stages of that, but. Again, I think that will become a lot more clear in 2020, and uh, it's going to, uh, you know, once that is in place, that's going to make it a lot more clear how we can move forward with this. Yeah, and it's always depend on who is in power and uh, people in power in time. So, and I don't know, maybe in 2020 there will be a more, uh, um, I'd say that a more. Uh, friendly legislation for the project uh, yeah, this, this kind of stuff uh, it will be according to the lobby and the politics country. yeah so. yeah and okay and uh, some mention of CalRx and uh, CivicRx so yeah the CalRx is the, that proposal I mentioned earlier that the you know state of California might start producing some medicine locally within the state um, yeah. And uh, uh, perhaps for for use and consumption outside the state as well, yeah. uh, but for that to be a kind of publicly controlled production effort. Uh, but last time I checked, they didn't really disclose which kind of drug they were going to produce. So we still don't know if insulin would be part of it. Yeah. So I think I think it's great, and I think it can be provide a lot of. I mean, help a lot of people who don't have access to the drug. Yeah. But often this kind of project, I'm a bit um, um, cautious because I always think that they will not totally go against the the, the big the interest of the big farmer, and they will don't go for the more juicy. They will go target the one more which are producing less value. Uh, so maybe I'm a bit conspirationist in this one, and I believe that they just, you know, have a big dinner and talk and say, oh yeah, it's a good deal thing, but don't make it that we will lose too much money, you know. So I, until they disclose which drugs they will produce, I don't, I don't, I, I kind of, you know, don't really so. I mean, I would keep a low profile and not be too excited by that before I know. Yeah, yeah, so uh, let's see here. Please can look into working with CalRx and our CivicRx. Uh, yeah, we actually have looked into that. Um, yeah, we were looking into uh, 
the ones that were around, which was uh, Civic RX and Intermountain Health uh, last year. That's another hospital consortium that's looking into doing a similar thing. Um, and uh, yeah, we are actually also seeing if our contacts uh, in the uh, the California legislature might be able to, uh, you know, get us a conversation with CalRx. So um, again, a little uh, not uh, not entirely ideal to have that discussion before we have our prototype up and running. But we are kind of just putting our feelers out and getting as far along to get that set up as we can. On, you know, as much as is prudent, let's say. Um, and I think, you know, the, the true time to go after that with with full force will will still be a little bit in the future, but we are getting uh, kind of prepared for that. Um, okay, and it just turned four o'clock, so um, we could uh, look to wrap it up in a couple minutes here, but maybe we'll just have... Uh, a last round of any any questions that are still on people's minds and we'll try to address them really quickly before we sign off here. No more questions? All right, uh, Esther, thanks Jan and Anthony, go get them. All right, we can do that. Okay. All right, thank you. We we'll another... Start. We should advertise for the next one because it was kind of a, a, a first first one, kind of test one. So yeah. we do another one um, on next Tuesday, right? Yep. Yeah. So we're gonna have more members from the team yeah. next Tuesday. We're gonna um, talk a little bit more about our ongoing fundraising effort and some more of the stuff that's going on with the organization. Um, so yeah, uh, be sure to drop in, uh, Esther, keep rallying the troops for that one. That'll be the big one. And we're gonna do a little bit more of a push on uh, our social media platforms for that as well. But, and thank you for uh, coming to our inaugural you know, test run stream and bearing with us. Fortunately, it didn't go too, uh, too roughly. And, and I guess we, we were able to spend most of the time talking about uh, questions of substance. So uh, this was great. Thank you, everyone.